television highlights of the news of yesteryear. It's 1936 as USS Indianapolis steams into harbor of Rio de Janeiro with President Franklin Roosevelt aboard. As chief executive of the United States, Roosevelt is greeted by playing of Brazil's national anthem. And cheers greet him as he's welcomed to South America's biggest republic by President Getulio Vargas. Is something missing here? Yes, it's famed cigarette holder, so evident in Roosevelt's later years. War threatens mankind as FDR appears before Brazilian legislature. The motto of war is let the strong survive, let the weak die. The motto of peace is let the strong help the weak to survive. This is no time to hesitate. We must be guided by a serene and generous view of our common needs. We cannot countenance aggression from wheresoever it may come. The people of each and every one of the American republics, and I am confident to the people of the Dominion of Canada, wish to lead their own lives free from desire for conquest and free from fear of conquest. Touring ever southward, Roosevelt makes historic stop at Montevideo to become subject of year for Uruguayan cameramen. President Gabriel Terra of Uruguay greets FDR as warmly as did Brazil's Vargas and thousands cheer as the chief executive from North America is paraded through streets of this great South American capital. Familiar face in the United States is rare and exciting sight to these Uruguayans. On way home, Roosevelt stops off at Trinidad. With son James standing by, he reviews Trinidad troops, then heads for home for Washington and work. It's 5th of March, 1926, and future generals of the United States Army look more like wooden soldiers as they rehearse routines for coming musical at Academy. Wax of World War II were great improvements over these Army girls, but then maybe the real difference is in what they were wearing in those days, don't you know? The shoe doesn't fit, but this cadet will wear it. Horrors, what's this? Oh, the leading lady. Can you imagine some top, top sergeant taking orders from any of these lovely looking second lieutenants? Seriously though, after months of hard work at West Point, cadets deserve the relaxation of maneuvers such as this. And just look at them maneuver. It's April 1928, and in New Haven, Connecticut, State Highway Commissioner McDonald throws switch that puts automatic traffic cop in operation at one of city's busiest intersections. Now light will be changed by flow of traffic. Mayor Tower congratulates Signal's inventor, Hoff, on perfection of device that will be boon to motorists and men in blue. After successful New Haven test, device soon spread across entire nation. Tom Marshall in December 1919, as Woodrow Wilson's vice president tells Senate page boys that he's going to give them big Christmas dinner. As Wilson's running mate in two elections, Marshall was vice president from 1912 to 1920.
Arriving in Pasadena in 1922, here's pioneer movie actress Pola Negri. Greeting one of top stars of silent films is Jesse L. Lasky. And yesterday's newsreel gets good look at Hollywood royalty of era that is gone. Arriving at White House for interview with President Warren Harding, here's famed king of the hobos. He's Jeff Davis, friend of the poor jobless wanderer who lives the beautiful life. But Davis, they say, was worth $200,000. and luxury flyer city of San Francisco clicks across tracks with smoothness of wind as it races westward out of Chicago across the plains toward California's Golden Gate. For two years, train has made 2,200 mile journey at high speed without mishap. Then this. There's horror and human suffering in this havoc disaster wrought at the Humboldt River trestle as Flyer tumbles into Nebraska Canyon. 24 are dead and scores injured as all but three of train's 17 cars plunge from the roadbed into the shallow water below this bridge of tragedy. Then something even more terrible than the wreck itself is uncovered. Even as rescue workers search crushed cars for dead and injured, investigators find rail that was apparently loosened from ties by some depraved person. Actual sabotage was never proved, so culprit was never caught. But death of 24 persons and injury to more than 100 others was not charged to engineer or railroad. But this was sad day for Flyers passengers and America's railroads. For city of San Francisco was last word in rail travel, last word in comfort and safety. But at Humboldt Trestle, the last word belonged to death. March 1930, and in Berlin, Germany, here's Mr. Golem, man of iron and nerves of steel. But he's as mild-mannered and well-trained as Aunt Fifi's pet poodle, doing everything his master and inventor tells him to. Operated and controlled by sound of his inventor's voice, Mr. Golem can do anything, do anything but breathe, thank goodness. It's 2nd of March, 1929, and here at Reedley California Airfield, Dale Drake climbs into his glider at start of record-breaking trip. Towed by monoplane pilot and pal Lloyd O'Donnell, Drake is out to set new distance record for gliders. And right now, he's plenty up in the air about it. It might look easy, but that air's rough, and a glider pilot isn't windproof. Over Los Angeles, Drake and Glider near end of 200 mile hop. Ahead lies Long Beach and happy landings, we hope. Cut loose from tow plane, Drake brings his glider to good old terra firma at Long Beach and flyers O'Donnell and Drake get good welcome from their proud, relieved and happy wives. Exposure. It's 1926, and in the latest fashion of the time, these well-dressed vacationers are sailing happily toward sunny climes. It must be getting warmer already, for squirrel coats are shed for sleeveless dresses. Well, anyway, sleeveless sacks. For good times in 1926, you kept your head in a tan. Maybe she's trying to look ahead to see what fashion designers are planning next year. Here's the most popular number of the year, the King Tut Ensemble. That fine young pharaoh was buried in it 3,000 years ago, so the well-dressed women of 1926 think it's good enough for them to be buried in. Say, did she find...
find her outfit in King Tut's tomb just recently, or did King Tut give it to her personally? Figure it out for yourself. What we can't figure out is why she's so shy about being seen in that lovely bathing suit. salty and stiff, and they both blew lustily way back in 1926. Touche! It's 5th of March, 1926, and at Northwestern, co-eds go in for the unfair art of self-defense with a dangerous weapon. And the girls aren't fooling with those foils. Here's the instructor in Northwestern's newest addition to the curriculum. After getting a few pointers, these pupils practice pointing. It's not polite, but no offense is meant, because this is fencing, and these co-eds of 1926 are taking more than a stab at it. On rain-swept Altoona racetrack, Speed demons of early 30s roar down straightaways and around slippery turns at average speed of better than 100 miles an hour. Early in race, all eyes are on 23-year-old Billy Arnold, for he's pushing car number four around Speedway at average speed of 120 miles an hour. And at speed like that on track as wet as this, there's bound to be a crack up for young Billy at any turn. taking lead toward finish line, and here he is holding lead against hot racing rivals until he's won his race. It's all over now but the shouting and congratulations as victorious Billy Arnold wins Altoona Speed Race. Billy Arnold, winner of Race in the Rain.